Hello and welcome again. It's been a minute. Um, for those who are new to the channel, my name is Daniel and I've been up and about for a while and we've not been able to post certain videos that I apologize for. Um, most of the reasons are due to the fact that I was on the feature and it took a long while to get out of creation mode. For me, there are like two headspace. There's the teaching headspace, there's the research headspace and there's the creating headspace. And to be able to function in the film, I had to go into like the creating headspace, which means abandon all reason, do your research and do like a lot that would help, um, that would help the movie to become what it is. And that kept me occupied for a while. Hopefully, um, when it gets released, I'll be able to like, we'll be able to like discuss it or share any fail points or interesting learning pathways that was uncovered during the process of creation. But that aside, um, today is dedicated to um, understand we'll do a movie breakdown today where we'll get like understand um, shooting exteriors specifically we'll pick a film from 2022 called Prey and this was a, an interesting film shot by um, Dan Trantenberg I hope I didn't kill his name with the DP Jeff Cotter was really interested in making a movie told with as few words as possible. Just a very cinematic visual experience. Elemental. Something very man versus nature. On paper, this is a story about a young woman who wants to be a warrior. And she's facing many oppositions. Why do you want to hunt? because you all think that I can't. But it's much more than that. I saw a sign in the sky. And we will just take a look at some of your principles. And this is one of the whole, um, this is one of the most interesting projects whereby a bulk of it was um, set in the exteriors you get. Very few played out in the interiors. And it was very interesting how they could navigate that entire conversation. So um, we'll be taking a look at it, jumping into the project and discussing what they, and how they went to uh, about um, shooting certain frames, their contrast ratios, and entirely, most of it comes down to um, planning, which was very key. As opposed to, there are several ways to like skin a cat or to like cook a meal, you get bear. One of the approach was actually to work within nature and to work within the specification of the quality of light available at certain time of day. And that allowed them the luxury of being able to shoot, as you would hear from some of their interviews of how they were able to like capture and defend certain um, parts of the conversation. By the way, I just want, I want to underline the thing you're saying about what's in front of the camera is as much to do with cinematography as what, what we're doing behind the camera. But it... I, I, just because for people watching, I don't, when you make that statement, I know you're, what you're, you're not saying, um, you're not putting the onus on. This will come all the way full circle to pray. Because what I really learned was like, so much of it is what is about what you put in front of the camera versus like all the tools and all the things you have to capture the image. If you have beautiful characters and beautiful makeup and wardrobe and you put them in a great environment, shoot that that's the, the, that's how you get these amazing images that we're all like that we you know aspire for and that we we associate with like big cinema someone else's job to to make yours beautiful in fact you i, I remember uh talking a lot on on the first thing we made together 10 clover River lane choosing the practicals um mm -hmm. choosing sure help, yeah, help yeah. working with our ramsey uh avery yes. our designer on what yes. colors to use, uh, with the, what wallpaper we, we were making every decision together because you knew, um, how much that would affect the, the stuff where, where that's going into the lighting and the lenses and all those things. So, um, yeah, it's a uh, huge collaborative, like it's, it's when everyone comes together and when all the choices complement each other. And so when the things that you and the wardrobe you know, designer, the costume designer choose, and then those things are tested on camera. And then we all talk about it and say, well, maybe like because of the sort of film lot that we're using and the process that we're gonna do, maybe these blues are too strong or maybe these oranges are too weak or whatever it is. And 
yeah, it's all the sort of and everyone coming together and kind of trying to bring, you know, like your vision, the director's vision. And when all those things align and we can get the all the right things in front, you know, it's, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, I think I always say, it's like, if you point the camera in the right direction at the right time of day, yeah, you don't have to do much of anything. And it's an amazing shot. If yeah. you point it the wrong way at the wrong time, you work twice as hard and it still only looks half as good, you know? And this was showcased in if we, I would dive now into some of the stills. So for example, I put out a bunch of stills that I would look at. And now I'm in Resolve and my current workflow is going in between. Um, I just converted the stills from Shot Deck to, um, from Rec. 709 to reverse it back into the scene referred space, which is like the Ari um, colored space, which would allow us the ability to, if I turn off my note, to go back into like what the log should actually look like but technically this is not a log because we're looking at the graded file but this is close to what you get in terms of the log picture on the flanders here and using the ed lachman zone feature available in look design i could um, use this as a tool to study the quality of light the contrast ratios and a lot of other things that happen during the film so for example um um, if we look at this shot here, this is just a normal establishment shot you get. But if we turn on the EL zone, it tells us how they distributed the ratio from capture to degrade. And we get to like see um, most of the sky was left at about um, two stops overexposed. Like what well, that's like the brightest in the frame. And the darkest in the frame is somewhere four stops underexposed. You get. So if I turn off first color and we look at it in the normal Rec. 709, we get to see how they distributed the dynamic range. And most of these were subjected largely to the quality of time, I mean, the quality of light where this was shot, like when the sun given light was available at this time, because there's no way to light this. You just have to be there at the right time, at the right frame. This actually comes down to studying what's available within the given scope or your, of your location. So um, it all started by having like a great canvas which is an amazing location because if you look throughout the locations that we have in this film you get to see like they are actually generally amazing with the mountains in the foreground um in the deep background and the whole tree landscapes and how everything looks even the tropical rainforest you get to see most of it like all super nice which was shot on um uh, on an ari camera but that's like less significant to our quest here so if we look at this first image, right, um, I can guesstimate the time of day this was shot because you could shoot dawn for docks and docks for dawn. Uh, most of the dock stuff, like the one that was, that's looking at this is dawn. Most of the dawn stuff were usually shot around um, the blue hour in docks that they can control across multiple nights, especially if the sequence was long, like for um, um, this scene of the film. Because if you look at this shot, right, where she's facing away with the whole um, pre pre um, predator's blood in her eyes, you could see like the sun and the deep background, right? But if we go to like the reverse shot of when she's coming in, you could almost just see that um, you could almost see that there is no sun in the background. Because if you look at this man, he was here in the shot. This is him here again, right? But this just tells you that it was shot over. A uh, long period of, of days, right? It just gives you an idea of where it's shot. The house is still there. The continuity of the character of the lady in the background, 
right? She's still like here in the shot, but you can see it's a different day. There's like a telltale sign. But yeah, this is when we are now stitching more evenings to be able to get at night. But generally, let's just play and look at the contrast ratio of what the DP was working. If there's a key to fill, fill side, you get. Um, so if we go into a first color mode, right, you get to see most of the face was left half stop overexposed. And this was for Caucasian skins. So if it was a dark skin that was inside here, probably it's going to be one stop less on the expose, which will keep us like at the darker green level. And um, the skies generally was left on the, the brightest part was like the sun dot, which is like um, four stop overexposed. I'm thinking this is the gray that brought this dot to four stop because generally it should probably be clipping out the white based on, on that's what it looked like. And most of the large area of the skies is left on the one, I mean, half stop overexposed and two stop, some of the patches of hot clouds around two stops overexposed. But generally the hair and the face was um they have like a ratio between um let's say if we count the stops we have from the um if we count from the hair which is like three stops under right we have one two and half so two and a half stops between the e of the face of where the face is to where the hair is so you have two and a half stops um um, in that um, distribution range of how they actually distribute their stops in using EL zones. And this is quite interesting because um, matching it across, if we go to the next shot, we get to see that um, it also still carries. The face is now one stop and the darkest part of the image is now like um, three stops. Some of the, And the deep blacks are now kept at like on the first stop. So although this... Um, veers away a bit from the day work um, and mostly a little bit into like the coloring space but it just gives you an idea of how um, the ratios that they were using balancing and shooting all those blue hours and most of it like you can see in none of the shots um, you can um, you can tell where's the light coming from because this is just natural light you have to be here at this time to be able to get this kind of shot or else you'll not be able to see even this one you get there is no there's probably a bounce somewhere right but most of it is generally skylight and neck field that's actually available so this actually does that mean that they didn't use light to shoot no they um during the interviews there were some of the part where they use led torches but most of the the exteriors were mostly led to like diffusions that you could see in some of the bts frames that and actually being present at the right time like finding the right time working in hand in hand with god's own giving light to be able to create um some of these shots um so if we go to like the interesting day exterior like this is like a very bright day puffy cloud sun overhead very rich day right uh if you watch like i say look at the shot none of these shots could benefit from like an 18k balancing or being stagnant you get because they're actually in motion and all of this comes down to um understanding when the quality of light is available for you to be able to um use it exactly and on Prey, it was, your job was of a scheduler, you know, your <laughs> job was of a, you know, what time of day can we be here? And because we want to be there, you know, that thing, then how can we make it work so that we can actually get a day done and do that? You know, like, it's a totally different, seemingly different part of your brain. Sure. But yeah, but then on Prey, yes, because we were, what, like 80%, 75% day exterior, probably, right? More, oh, yeah. No, day exterior, but yeah. So yes, then the hard part is kind of bending the schedule and getting everyone, which is easy with you because you appreciate and know like, well, yeah, we want to do this great shot, but we also want to look, you want to look great and you don't ever settle. And it's difficult. Well, I think I had to learn a little bit. There was, there's probably a few moments where I was like, we just need to get, I'm sure it'll still look, you know, and then we did. And I was like, oh yeah, I get it. I get it. Backlight. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, to a yeah. degree, but you start from a great place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you sometimes you work on films where it's just like, we just have to go. I know the director. It's just like, it doesn't matter. I need to shoot this right now. And sometimes that's like, I get that. It's fair. And at the end of the day, it doesn't help the film if you get one great looking shot that doesn't help the movie. Like, yeah. there needs to be a balance. Yeah. Because if every, like, and even in Prey, as proud of it as, as I am, there are still things where we were like, okay, well, this will be in front light or side light, and we have to use the, do this part now. We just have to do. We can't always flip. You know, we don't have the 
capacity to flip an entire set and shoot everything yeah. in the backlight. But yeah, so you try to get as much of it choose, in the backlight. You sort of choose what we think the yes. scene's going to live in, you know, yes. versus what is sort of a thing that's just going to get us to the the next iconic, you know, visual or whatever right. it is. Yeah, yeah. So for for we that have like poor planning schedule or not respecting time or not being cautious, you would not be able to maximize it, which means there's so much richness available there for those of us that do not have tools. This quality is still within reach because generally this is what the entire film did on several occasions, which were bounces, diffusion, and generally working with the sun and the weather and shooting in this right season you get and not being able to like um come up with um cherry pickers that had neck feels and fly swats and big diffusions none of that were happening there although they get diffused light but mostly plays around shooting at, around um um where the sun would be pending the light so if we turn on ailson just just curiosity and see where our uh, ratios are um, the skin is generally kept around half stop over expose against the brightest part of the image which is somewhere around which is the sky and perfect clouds that are like three stops over you get so you have like a ratio of um um key to fill in this shot whereby uh, most of because they are being backlight by the sky right the rest of the um of the ground is filled by most of the skylight the sky becomes like a giant soft box that just fills into the shadows whereby you can have like more exposures but not like direct sunlight and why they can actually use bounce like push it in and softening it and most of the quality of this would happen somewhere around um if i were to use our own time here right this would be probably around the 10 o'clock 11 o'clock whereby you have like the clouds moving in and this is quite difficult to shoot because sometimes it could present inconsistency you get and this could actually be like a fill a fill point for if it's a long scene to be able to like keep this consistent but as if as a short moving part you get to see it's gonna like work well you get and same thing happened when we were in the forest so there was one particular shot where she was in the forest i'm shooting in the cover of shades right if we if we look at the shot we're in this shot right and we turn on our ear zones same things happen skin is kept and this is mind you for um lighter skin tones but i won't call her caucasian because um they're supposed to be like native americans so they're not like that caucasian but they're kept under um one stop under you get and generally there's no much deep contrast between the forages in the bush and them um, and the brightest part is somewhere exposed or the brightest in the image usually exposed around three stops of exposure generally if you look at this entire scene most cameras can capture it because the brightest thing is around plus three and the darkest thing is around let's see um minus four right then absolute black is six and that's just about if we count it like normally that will actually just give us um over nine stops of dynamic range and most cameras can do 16 13 12 which means um, on your normal cameras if you do know your scenes well and do know what you you could actually do a lot with less and this just show you how versatile things have become and doing the prep work how you can benefit from it and a lot of this has um, transpired there were some places whereby they had to like overwork for it which i did not include in the shot like for example um some of the night um the fog scenes with the predators that was like a different um long onslaught that they had to do with the with the with the managing of the consistency of the fog bear and some of the shots were also like vfx like if you look at this shot here most of it is generally vfx because generally the line's not real though and they have to like do the blue screen and the green screen to be able to get like the shot you get but the levels were real some of them um you could see how they manage on the exposure and keeping it noise free just playing on the undertone of from minus three to six which is where um they allowed most of it um, um did leave you get and balancing and shooting that because even if you see this is like a light that's actually coming in that you can see that's highlighting her that's giving her like this half stop of exposure that's giving her a little bit of rim you get so you can tell like the du source this was they didn't actually light it with the actual moon but they made it look as though it was the moon that was lighting it you get by giving that 
not so hard defined shadows but making it to actually like kiss the trees and actually open up the background but a lot of it was less invasive and was able to like shape and craft things and be able to like play with the gradation of the shadow tones to be able to make it a lot more um separated removing absolute black from most of the tones that exist in murky shadows so it's not like it's flat as black it's not bright as day you can see like there's a cut off the light that's coming it's been cut off by the trees and it's not going to like the ground here so all of these things are like um trying to simulate how it will how nature actually if this was in nature how it would look like as opposed to heightened reality and i think it makes a very interesting um case study right so you can go watch the film and look at some of the interviews that um, um they had online about what about the process of the film but generally um, most of this speaks to the fact that for example this last wide shot that we have in the frame right there is no way they could have lit this you get if not being pressed there on the time and same theme carries on throughout every part of the frame a bit of bounce a bit of fog for atmosphere great lenses i believe these the cook lenses on on this film the cook anamorphics and just walking and massaging um, the entire terrain, allowing like nature to do the heavy lifting while you are like big on schedule, you get. And also having the patience to admit it that, oh, we didn't have the shot today. Because sometimes, well, with nature also comes the unpredictability of weather, you get, which is why they have, you might have to like time your seasons and know when you'll be, when will be a good time to actually make some of the shots um, or when to be good to actually work with them. So um, this actually, um, bleeds into the whole um, um, consciousness of as, a, as an artist of knowing what is available to you and how you can sculpt it and shape it into what would work. And as independent filmmakers, this could also like help you understand how you could work with the limitation of what's giving you free, like free sunlight. And um, a lot of backlighting was used in this film. A lot of diffusion was used in the film because if you watch... Um, Diffusion by nature or diffusion by landscape or even diff active diffusion. Like in this frame, you can see that there's, t there's actually a bounce in her eyes um, that's actually lifting up like the neck area. But there's like the sky where the light's coming from. And if you look at the waters to the to this side of the frame, right? If you look at the waters to this side of the frame, you can see the rocks that's creating shadow, which means the sun is coming from um, this side of the screen, right? Light in the background. Why she's like now in the shadows, creating like this kind of soft alley light whereby the sky becomes like the soft box and they could like just use neck feel to be able to um, take it out. You get, take out some of the light that would come from this side. You get, and that just makes it a lot more natural. But if you watch, when they reverse the shot, now this is the interesting part about light continuity because they're playing with the, because it has its downsides and these are some of the downsides. You get, but it's so good when you watch the film, your brain would never pick this up. You get, the sun is now on this side, coming in, right? Whereas the sun was on the other side of the rock. The bare CGI, bare, somehow they broke continuity, but it still looked great that if you go between the this and this, somehow your brain just says, yes, that's normal. Okay, so if we look at it very well, the sun is coming in from this side. It's not coming in from this side like we imagined before. You get, so it's not, you do not get it coming from this side of frame it's coming in from this side because you can see how it's highlighting these branches here how it's highlighting these rocks and the rocks are now in shade so it's actually coming frontal towards her as opposed to coming in from her dark side you get so um here it just kind of carries on although it's not like light continuity but it kind of just matches and you do not just think about it of where or how it looks but it just looks so great by respecting um, the quality of light you get and actually keeping the contrast ratio which is helping the entire um, story to actually match well because if we actually get out of this and actually check contrast ratio we'll see that it's similar across the film maintaining such ratio even if um, the continuity is not that um, um, the same you get the brightest in the image somewhere around two um, yes half stop over on the skin and there is like the darkest thing that we can see obviously is the black hair but if we measure somewhere around her dark side it's still like um minus three minus four so still under that three um two and a half three um stops or three and a half stops of um of dynamic range 
And the way I'm using EL zones, like I showed you, is in Look Designer, which just helps you technically see how the data is distributed. You get um, and gives you an, an, an inference on what to do you get. And you can see most of the entire film during the day exteriors are backlit. Most of them, you get your very few scenes that are front -lit. The ones that are front -lit are in shade, like we saw with the last frame here, you get most of them are generally usually backlit. You get, and that's quite interesting because backlight characters looks great in backlight for exterior. So working with, the, with nature and the sun, um, would help you achieve interesting looks if you do know how to um, manage the quality of light. And some of the things you could actually try doing is probably if you have such kind of scenarios whereby you probably have an epic or some kind of film that takes place in the large exteriors, you could go there and probably take a picture to be able to study the quality of light that actually happens. You get If you have like an instant, like a 360 camera that sees all around, you could probably take pictures at different time of day so you can go and observe and study when it's foggy, when it's sunny, when it's a little bit like has partial, partially sunny where it has like puffy clouds. It'll give you an idea of when to shoot and you can actually now like team up and plan with your AD and the production and say, okay, this is the blueprint um, I have come up with. Um, yourself and the director, or if you're the director, you could also tell like a producer, okay, this is how long it's going to take. This is what we're going to need because it just requires patience and proper planning. So I hope you found this very useful and I hope um, you do check out the movie when you have some time and I hope it contributes to your knowledge and hopefully that I am back. We'll try to put out way more content and catch up with what's going on in the world because sometimes creation is a journey that sends you off to a different vertical. And now we're back, we we'll get to pick up the slack and the pieces. If this video has been useful to you, please like and subscribe. And until next time when I see you, please improvise, adapt and overcome.